Hello and welcome to Motor Week. We're at the first Geneva International Motor Show of the new millennium. And over the next half hour we shall be having a rummage around and sorting out some of the very best bits for you. Richard, that sounds good. Let's go rummage. Let's do it. Well, what else can you say about this other than that it's probably the most gorgeous car here at the Geneva Motor Show. It's the 360 Spider, and it's set to be the fastest soft top in production. It will share the engine with the coupe and it also has that gorgeous glass panel that lets you look at the power plant. After all, if you're spending 107 grand, you'll want to know where your money's going. What do you think of it, Rich? It's horrible. It's, I, I wouldn't have it if you gave me it. Garbage. It looks like hideous and rubbish. It's awful. You're weird. I can't move. It's gorgeous. It has to be mine. Now it's a bit of a shock to discover that the sexy Feline is based on the sensible 607 saloon that's due to go on sale in the UK in July. Of course it shows just how much a manufacturer can do with one platform. I mean just ask Volkswagen who seem to be intent on taking over the world with a platform from the Golf. Now, Porsche, of course, are known for producing cute little super minis, but supercar territory is something that they haven't ventured into before. Yet, whilst the Feline certainly has supercar looks that could rival a Ferrari or a Porsche, the good news is that the price tag won't leave your bank balance in tatters. If Peugeot ever do make it, it should be priced at around 40 grand, which isn't bad for a car that packs a 3-litre V6 engine that can power up to 140 miles an hour. Wow, just look at in here, it's an absolute riot. Sitting in the cockpit, you're very aware that the bonnet just stretches away in front of you. This car certainly is all bonnet and not an awful lot else. You've just about squeezed two people here in the cockpit. It really is minimalist motoring. You've got a couple of dials, controls for the air conditioning. That's really about it. But the very best bit is a remote control that works the air conditioning, the radio, and would you believe, even adjust the driver's pedals for you so you can get the perfect driving position. Very nice. Wow, well, with the Paladine or Paladine, and I'm honestly not sure which it is, Peugeot have decided to explore the luxury and executive end of their 607. So we have a 607 platform, stretched and lengthened with, I suspect, a 306 dropped in sideways, maybe, and then inside every executive luxury gizmo you could have. It's a kind of mega first-class air cabin in there with fold-out tables and computers and matching glasses. And in an interesting reverse of the very old-fashioned luxury cars, where the poor old driver or chauffeur sat at the front with no roof all exposed to the element and the passengers were comfy and enclosed, it's, it's the other way around. The roof here folds back into the boot, so while the driver's enclosed in nasty, boring, stuffy car, the passengers at the back can sit back and enjoy the feeling of the wind through what's left of their thinning executive hair. Very nice. The, the designers were given complete freedom to uh, express themselves. There's a limousine, talks about luxury and comfort, and obviously there's a sporty, exciting performance version. So, who knows, Richard? There's, there's every chance. Depends on your reaction, depends on the reaction we get from the public. There could well be some derivatives, some exciting uh, models along the lines of these cars here. In a sector that's been dominated by cars that could have been called hairdressers' chariots, the good old RAV4 has always been something of a cut above the rest. But like the very best style, it was in need of something of an update. And Toyota have obliged. They've unveiled this new version here at the Geneva show. It's got a little bit more rotund and has developed some very nice curves, particularly around the wheel arches. It'll go on sale towards the end of the year and will be available in a three or a five door version.
Somewhere out there lurks the new Volvo V70, but Eliza Portelli has been out to steal the march on us all and take a close look at it. There are many things to admire about the Swedes. Blonde hair, tall, beautiful people, relaxing in their saunas while gently whipping themselves with birch twigs. But despite this playful image, they are rather dull people. And nothing reflects this more than a big boxy Volvo estate. Boring it may be, but the exterior oozes class and style. This body is well screwed together. Panel fit and paintwork will stand comparison to any German mark. It is sleeker than the outgoing model, the windscreen seems to slope more and it has a rather pointed new front end. The manufacturer tells us that this car is 10cm shorter than its competitors but with clever design, it still maintains the same interior space. The interior is very comfortable. All controls are easily to hand, and it's got all the toys even a broad executive could hope for. The boot's low capacity is, as you would expect, very impressive. This model is the T5. It boasts an impressive 250 brake horsepower from the five-cylinder 2.3-litre turbocharged engine. The T5 designation, first seen in the early 90s on the 850, caused a stir in suburbia. A performance car with room for the kids and the dog. I haven't really been able to exploit the performance of this car on this short test drive, but it feels very quick with brakes and handling to match. This car is no sports car though. The sheer bulk makes this a rather formidable beast to pilot through narrow country lanes. However, if your two-seater sports car days are now behind you, this car is capable of putting a great big smile on your face. Once you drop the kids off, of course. Volvo Estates have a very strong image, but that doesn't come cheap. The T5 model comes in at a whopping £30,000, and the entry model is still £23,000. Now that kind of money will get your bum nestled in the leather seat of some serious motorcars. If you want a Volvo Estate but hanker after the image of a 4x4, then you'll have to wait till the summer when the XC all-wheel drive becomes available. Now if you like this car, then you'll probably never be happy with a BMW 5 Series or a Grand Cherokee, no matter how good they are. So by the boxy estate, it is a good replacement to a fine motor car. I give the Volvo estate, the auto industry, two kids and a Labrador award. Time was when you had to look at the M3 badge before you could be absolutely sure it was an M3 and not just another hotted up 3 Series saloon, but not anymore. It's basically the same recipe for this M3, the third generation is in the past. Take a very competent, though in my opinion perhaps not too interesting saloon and turn it into a real sports car, keeping the practicality of the saloon. So 0 to 60 comes up in 5.2 seconds. It's got 343 brake horsepower from an all new six cylinder engine and modifications to the suspension as well. Should be very, very good. These days, Fiat are coming up with some extremely bold and original cars, and this is a perfect example of that. It's called the Eco Basic, and as the name suggests, economy is its big thing. On just three litres of diesel, it will travel 100 kilometres, and that frugality is going to be carried on to the price. It should cost far less than even your average super mini. Some people are suggesting as little maybe as five, five and a half grand. The styling on the Eco Basic is very different and it is also very clever. The bonnet remains sealed at all times, although of course it can be opened in the workshop. But all those motorists need to worry about is this little plastic panel at the front that houses 
the fuel and the water and the oil. And that's just enough of the oily bits of the car that I really want to see. Now the EcoBasics body panels are made out of dyed plastic, which means this will be a perfect vehicle for new drivers. All those accidental knocks and occasional bumps will hardly leave a trace. Join us after the break when we'll have more from the Geneva Motor Show and Ken Gibson takes a trip to the Arctic Circle to drive the Peugeot 607. Welcome back to Geneva for the first European Motor Show of the Millennium. Now we all know Audi can build a pretty nifty four-wheel driver, but up until now you wouldn't want to take one off the road. But you might do this, it's the all-road and it is their new off-roader. And it is very much an off-roader, despite its rather estate car looks. It has some pretty sophisticated off-road technology that is a low-ratio transfer box, unusual on cars in this class. And it has height adjustable suspension, it can start off nice and high and rugged for off-road use. Then once you get on the road and increase your speed slowly by four stages, it lowers itself. Going to be available with two nice meaty engines, there'll be a big powerful turbo diesel and there'll also be a nice V6 bi-turbo so it should go a bit as well. All good news, but I'm not entirely sure about the tartan interior. Very nice. Whew. You know, there's nothing like the arrival of summer to make you want to get your top off, how is there? And there's an even better reason to do it now, because BMW have added a convertible to the new 3 Series range. It's due to go on sale in May and will be initially available only as the 323 CI, although further engine options will arrive on our shores sometime next year. The 323 features BMW's 2.5 litre inline six cylinder engine that delivers 170 brake horsepower and promises a punchy and involving drive, complete with very stylish looks. As you'd expect in here, the interior is absolutely stunning. It's got that good old German build quality. The seats are very comfortable and even match my outfit. The Nissan Maxima QX. It's very big very Japanese. We hardly bought any of the old one and Nissan are hoping we're going to buy loads of a new one. It's true. Last year in America they sold about 130,000 of these. In the UK will you be very hard put to find one. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's extremely well put together. Very comfortable, very well equipped. It's going to have a great range of engines including a lovely V6 24 valve, loads of power to haul along a big, safe, comfy car. But we don't buy big Japanese cars, just as we don't buy big French cars. We do buy big German cars. Maybe this could be the one that breaks the mould. Nissan will doubtless be hoping so. Our intrepid traveller Ken Gibson is a braver man than I and Richard. He's been off to the Arctic Circle to drive Peugeot's new saloon, the 607. <sighs> the lengths we go to on men and motors to bring you the extraordinary road tests. I hope you appreciate it. As you might have gathered by the... Uh, a rather unusual scenery behind me. We're in Finland, right at the top of Finland. In fact, we're about sitting on the Arctic Circle. And we've come in search of a very special car. I feel a bit like Scott of the Antarctic. I certainly feel cold enough for it. Let's go and see if we can find this car in amongst all this snow. It's got to be around here somewhere. Let's have a look. Aha! Got you. I knew I'd find it. So here we have it, ladies and gentlemen, the all-new Peugeot 607 executive car. A car that has an exceedingly tough task on its hands. Peugeot didn't really want us to drive it until tomorrow, but as there's only about three hours daylight over here, I told them time was of the essence. So let's get in it and let's get away and drive it. Welcome to my winter wonderland of snow. Isn't this marvellous? Well, the good news is that it's finally daylight. And the other good news is that we put the 607 to test on tarmac roads last night. It isn't actually snow everywhere here. And uh, the initial reports were very good. The car drives as you'd expect of an executive. Peugeot are very sensibly being very realistic about their ambitions. They're not actually going for the German big boys, but they're aiming for the Vauxhall Amiga the one mass-produced manufacturer that stayed in the executive sector and done very well. Peugeot believe that their new 607 has got the style, the price and the equipment to make a big dent into Vauxhall sales. Peugeot have invested so heavily into technology for the 607 
but they actually claim it's got more computer technology on board than an Airbus jet. One of the big safety features is emergency braking assistance that improves the car's stopping distance by a significant 25%. I also like the fact that the hazard flashes come on in an emergency braking situation to warn following vehicles of the potential danger. And how about a warning sensor that lets you know if any of the pressure in the four tyres drops? Of course, the 607 has all the usual executive toys, like navigation system, cruise control, a telephone with a special emergency call button, and it's also one of the cleanest cars for emissions on the road. But the real pièce de résistance of the safety air technology is that the car's fitted with the very clever electronic stability programme. Once you're inside the 607, there is no doubt that it is a genuine contender for the executive class. It has everything you'd expect and stands very favourable comparison with the interiors of the BMWs and in fact the Mercedes. What I particularly like about it is how well the leather and the wood blends together. It looks very natural. It's very warm and inviting. What I also like is the simplicity of the layout. It's all easy to the eye, easy to touch. Everything's in the right type of place. I also like the shape of it, there's a lot of curves to the dash and it has a very, very comfortable feel about it. I really have to say this ESP is the business. I'm driving on what can be only described as sheet ice with a covering of snow and it's handling remarkably. It's only when you really push it that you can feel the back end go and then it gets corrected again by the system. This is a really practical, genuine benefit to the ordinary driver. The 607 gets off to a flying start because it's a big car with genuine road presence. And that's courtesy of some very neat design cues that come from the Drop Dead Gorgeous 406 Coupe. I particularly like the very bold lights at the front. They're slightly reminiscent of the lights on the 206, which has made that such a leader in the style stakes. And at the rear, it has definite shades of the 406 Coupe and that can't be bad. You get a choice of three new engines. There's a 2.2 petrol, a 2.2 turbo diesel, and a new three liter V6. All of which seem to perform pretty impressively from the short drives that we've had of them. This Peugeot is very, very big. Take a look at the back for room. Now I may not be the biggest, but this really is an awful lot of knee room, head room, arm room. This is a very comfortable place to be for a passenger. But the biggest of it all is the boot. It's absolutely huge. There's more room in the boot than in my living room. So, the million dollar question is, is the undeniably stylish Peugeot 607 capable of making a dent in the executive car market? I think it is, but I think the key issue is price. If they can get a price around about 19.5 for the entry level model when it arrives in June, I think they've got a very good chance of definitely denting Amiga sales. I even think there's a potential to take sales from the German big boys, because there's got to be a few of those people that want something a little different and aren't totally obsessed with the old badge. Anyway, that's the end of this report. The only thing that's really worrying me is that Peugeot seem to be expecting me to stay in this uh, teepee, which looks rather bleak. But there again, there have been people telling me for years that I really needed a teepee. I think they meant a teepee. So, you've got your front end with the, uh, well, the engine, that's the big bit. Then you've got some little orange wiggly bits that come down to some big black boxes. Then you've got your long grey fuel cells. And then you've got some really shiny bits. These are great, they're very, well, shiny. And your uh, CO selective oxidizer. What is it? Well, it's fuel cell technology. I don't know how it works, but basically it's good for the environment and it doesn't use petrol. Where's it found? Uh, well, it's over there, but it ain't pretty. Be what I mean, it ain't pretty. This is prettier.
See? Now don't say I didn't warn you. Good for the environment it may well be. Easy on the eye, uh, well, no, not by quite a long way. Actually, that's unfair because it's not the exterior that's important just as well. It's what's going on underneath with that fuel cell technology. It's the FCX concept and it's called an exquisite sedan. Uh -huh. Still, good news for the environment, I'm sure it is. Good news for aesthetics, uh, no, not by a long way. Oh. Go on, try it, Adi, you'll do it. can't get in. <laughs> we were hoping to bring you a look at this. It's the T-Rex and it's made by Kodiori and uh, can't get in. We're too little for it's it. too big. We're going to go and find a smaller car. It's not a car, it's a house. You've got to be joking. <laughs> Morgans are not an acquired taste. If you don't fall in love with it the first time you get into one, you're never going to like them, you're never going to see the point, you're never going to really get them. This is history in the making behind me. It's the first new car from Morgan in about mm, 4,000 years. It's constructed entirely from aluminium. This time, wood is restricted to the cabin only and for decorative purposes. It's not used in the structure. Now this new car does share the beautiful V8 with the current Plus 8 that you can go out and buy now, but whereas that uses wood in its chassis and bucks and rides and flexes like it's alive and rather cross at you, this promises to be a sharp, proper sports car. And if you like Morgans, oh, you've got to have it. It's got to be mine. So that's it for this week's look at some of the highlights from the Geneva Motor Show. But there's more to come. And we'll be bringing you more highlights in next week's programme. So make sure you join us then. Goodbye.